Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Naomi Schaefer Riley, and I'm a senior fellow here at the American Enterprise Institute. Here at AEI, we are committed to finding policy solutions that will help the most vulnerable families in our country. In order to do so, though, we have to first understand what exactly is making them vulnerable. Some 3 million children in this country are investigated by our child welfare system each year. In fact, one in three children will be investigated before they turn 18. What are these parents being reported for? In most cases, the answer is neglect. While most of us understand what physical or sexual abuses are, we are hard pressed to define exactly what constitutes neglect. It varies a lot from state to state, county to county, and even among individual investigators. It is not uncommon, though, to hear that families are being caught up in our child welfare system because of poverty. Indeed, that poverty is actually being confused with neglect. The idea is that parents are being reported to child welfare agencies because their children aren't properly fed or clothed or housed. It's not because their parents are unwilling or unable to care for their children. It's that they don't have the means to do so. Many child welfare agencies and private nonprofits have pivoted in recent years toward providing more material supports for parents in the hopes that fewer families will need to be investigated and that more parents will be able to adequately care for their children. It's a noble goal, but whether poverty is actually driving child maltreatment and or child welfare involvement in this country, I think is an open question. To discuss the relationship between these two phenomena, I am thrilled to be able to introduce our panel today. Um, after that, I'm going to give each panelist an opportunity to explain how they see the relationship between child maltreatment and poverty. Before I do that, though, I want to offer a quick programming note. On December 12th, we're actually going to be hosting an event that I think is closely related to this one on the relationship between substance abuse and child maltreatment. I hope that you will join us for that as well. I think it will be helped to present a complete picture of what is going on in our child welfare system. So with that, I want to introduce our panelists. Uh, Doug Besheroff is a professor at the School of Public Policy at the University of Maryland. Uh, he was the first director of the US National Center on Child Abuse and Neglect. Uh, and he actually served as the administrator of the AEI White House Working Seminar on Integrated Services for Children and Families. Amelia Frank Meyer is the founder and CEO of the national nonprofit ALIA. Amelia and the team are leading a nationally co-designed movement to keep children safe with, not from their families. Previously, she was the CEO of a treatment foster care agency uh, serving 90 counties in Wisconsin and Minnesota. Sarah Ann Font, who's becoming a regular here, um, is a professor of sociology and public policy at Penn State, and she's also the associate director of the graduate program in sociology there. She is a member of AEI's Child Welfare Innovation Working Group and the author of numerous peer-reviewed studies on the child welfare system. Uh, and finally, Lynn Johnson uh, is the president and founder of All In Fostering Futures, a nonprofit that collaborates with churches and individuals in every state to help children and families at risk of being in the child welfare system and to care for foster care alumni. She served as the Assistant Secretary at HHS's Administration for Children and Families from 2018 uh, from, through January 2021. So welcome, everyone. Um, and we're going to start actually with Doug today. So please uh, tell us a little bit about what you see as the, the relationship between child maltreatment and poverty. Sure. Thank you very much for having me. Um, I think the slides are running. Uh, so I'm the oldest person on the panel, so I get to do history. Uh, and my bottom line is that part of our confusion about the relationship between child maltreatment and poverty and neglect is that a substantial part of what we call child abuse and neglect comes from the old welfare caseloads. So let me talk about that. This is welfare's growth and decline. Um, everyone knows that uh, someplace around 1994, the caseloads went down. This chart hasn't been updated since 2007, but you get the idea. Welfare went way down. My story is, though, at the left-hand side of the chart. And you'll see that welfare used to be a very small program in the 19. Uh, 40s and 50s, and the main reason for that is that it was limited to widows, mainly middle class, heavily white widows. It did not involve people of color, especially in the South, and did not include mothers uh, who had given birth out of wedlock. 
Uh, in the 50s and in the 60s, the welfare case laws expanded, and much more, uh, they were much more characterized by African Americans, especially coming up from the South, part of the Great Migration. Uh, that was a very needful group it had, um, and so the welfare system started providing supportive social services to those mothers. Um, the support of social services in those days were a little different from what they are now. A friend of mine was a welfare worker in New York City, and I said, what do you do for these families? And he said, well, there's one case I have. The mother's not sending her children to school, so I picked her up one day with the kids, carried them to school, and I told her, this is what you do every day. Uh, that was a heavy hand, however, and in the 1960s, as more divorced middle-class mothers, this is the 344 number, entered welfare, they didn't want this heavy hand. Uh, this heavy hand was also expensive. So the Nixon administration saw its way to save a fair amount of money by something they called the separation of social services from income maintenance. And what they did was they, they hired a bunch of low-paid income maintenance workers often not high school graduates, and promised social workers, but that never came through. That was the second half of the deal. I was in Chicago when the transfer happened. The entire city of Chicago had, I think, five teams of seven social workers each. So this was a caseload that was abandoned by the welfare system. At the same time, people were becoming extremely worried about child abuse and mandatory reporting laws were passed. The Federal Congress, in its typical way, sorry, Matt, decided it shouldn't just be a program for child abuse. They required that child neglect also be reported. The result was we had all these caseworkers, we had all these school teachers, we had all these mental health um, uh, uh, hospital personnel who were worried about the neglect, meaning the low income status of families, and they reported them to the system. So this caseload, which used to be a welfare caseload, became a child protective caseload in large numbers. Uh, that had major consequences. The welfare workers were liberals. They didn't like to take people to court. It was more complicated to get to court, so people didn't, weren't, neglectful parents or whatever they were, were not sent to juvenile court, and it, very few children were put in foster care. The movement of the cases to Child Protective Services put those cases within a, a team that was heavily, heavily oriented towards going to court, removing children for abuse, and they were deploy, easily deployed to take neglected children to court, and easily deployed to have them put in foster care. This was the process that occurred, and this is data from 2020. Uh, Naomi made the point already. This is the national caseload confirmed in 2020, and you can see that over 70% of the caseload is neglected children. <clears throat> and the giant question is, what percentage of those neglected children are in uh, deep need of protection, maybe because their children are substance abusers, maybe because it's a mislabeling, and what percentage of those children are just the old welfare caseload. Uh, there's not a lot of research on this. Uh, I did some work on this many, many years ago, and my conclusion was short of the um, really disoriented families, the vast majority of these cases were being driven by the same issues that focused on um, uh, poverty, neglect, and either mental health limitations or whatever. And this is a poor functioning group that needs support, whether it's 20% or 80% of that 75% number. Uh, they don't pose an immediate physical danger to their children. Uh, but they are a danger to their children's development. And I think, I hope, the, this panel will educate us all, including me, about how we think about all the children in those different bars, recognizing, though, that the big blue bar 
includes a lot of different kinds of cases. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Amelia? So um, we spend a lot of time in the field talking about this. My work is really alongside um, county directors and, and public service employees who are looking to reform their system and, and bring those numbers down. Um, and what we're seeing is, well, the, the Children's Bureau said, just to, to answer a little bit of the question of those 75%, that about 60% of those, that 75% with neglect, um, do not involve um, uh, abuse. And so really thinking about different ways of keeping families safely together. Uh, numerous studies have um, shown that poverty is really a significant predictor of child welfare system involvement, um, including placement in foster care, and, and that is true across all races. Um, families below the poverty line are about three times as likely to be substantiated for child maltreatment. And so thinking about what are the resources that can be deployed to keep families safely together, rather in preventative, lower investment ways, rather than um, the predictive long-term harm of family separation and the, and the additional cost of that as well. Um, there are many, many studies right now that are happening across the country with just emergent results, lots of pilot projects around um, experimenting with different amounts of, um, of supports to families in a preventative way to prevent family separation and maltreatment, and those early results are, are significant and positive. Uh, Chapin Hall just did a policy brief on this that has some of that, and our friends at Casey Family Programs are also tracking a lot of those in a collaborative. Uh, we have experimented with some early concrete supports in times of need, which is a protective factor uh, with families to try to avoid separation as often um, poverty and neglect are conflated, as, as was mentioned. And so are there things that we can do on the early side of things to help families in ways that would avoid family separation and placement? And I can give you just a, a quick example of that so you have some, a mental model for what that might look like. Um, in, in a county in, in which we partnered, there was a parent who had a child removed for neglect, um, did not bond well with the child, and the child was significantly neglected after birth. In many jurisdictions, um, the Child Protective Services could go and remove her second pregnancy without discussion, just on the um, knowing what happened with the first. In, in this county that we were working with, um, those early investments, uh, they were able to hire a doula for this mother to work on prenatal and postnatal bonding to address her postpartum depression, which was the driver of the, the lack of bonding. And that second baby bonded beautifully, and she was able to keep that baby. That investment was about a $700 investment, and um, the investment in uh, lifelong foster care placement and movement, or even just for a few years, is substantially more than that. So, so I'm working really on the ground in the field with our public partners to identify those kinds of preventative early investments um, that that mother could not afford, could never do, and as a result lost her first child, but with those smaller investments are able to do. Um, the other thing that I, I would say sort of as a report from the field that's happening are lots of states and jurisdictions looking at narrowing the definition of neglect. When we have a very broad catchment, we end up um, being able to bring kids in for things related to poverty uh, that are not necessarily worthy of family separation. So we have kids being called in for lice or not a heavy enough coat in the weather, things that are really clear indicators of families in need of support, but likely not in need of separation. And so thinking about that differently and, and um, thinking about the mandated reporter policies uh, that have really don't have a lot of um, oversight and regulation across jurisdiction and are applied very differently in different places and end up bringing in families who, if there was a place to call for help, they could get some early support. But really, we've used um, mandated reporting and child abuse hotlines as kind of the, the 911. Everything gets called in there. 
and there's no place to call for families to call for help or support or people worried about families for help or support without putting at risk what is most precious to them, which is their children. So lots of systems working on uh, warm lines or help lines versus hot lines so that families who need help and people who want to help families can um, be involved in an earlier way and, and manage issues of poverty outside of the penal system, outside of the child welfare or child protection system, and do those things in preventative ways. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Sarah? So I think I have the unfortunate distinction of disagreeing significantly with both of my co-panelists. So first I wanna say that um, the biggest category of neglect by far is not unmet material needs, it is inadequate supervision, which overwhelmingly means parents who have serious mental illness and parents who have serious substance abuse problems. So as early as the 1990s, the government reports were coming out saying, you know, 78 to 80 percent of confirmed abuse cases of kids coming into foster care had parents with a serious substance abuse problem. And so um, giving, you know, financial support in that situation is not likely to increase child safety in a meaningful way. Uh, so in a recent study um, of cases out of California uh, that reviewed all of the reports uh, that were investigated for neglect uh, in a random sample, they found that about 1% involved allegations solely about unmet material needs. There was no substance abuse, no mental health concerns, no co-occurring abuse, 1%. Second, I wanna say uh, the idea that neglect and abuse are really distinctive phenomena is actually not borne out by the evidence. So about 30% of cases of neglect involve concurrent allegations of abuse, and about 40% of infants who are initially solely reported for neglect are later referred for physical or sexual abuse. So these are in large part um, really overlapping populations. Similarly, the outcomes long-term for children who have experienced abuse and neglect are extremely similar. Um, if you look at the probability that kids drop out of high school, that they end up in jail or prison, um, all sorts of negative outcomes. The kids who are neglected look much more like the kids who are abused than they look like the kids who are poor but neither abused nor neglected. So, so that's a problem, right? So why do we sort of insist on these narratives about neglect that it's mostly poverty, that it's not as serious as abuse? In part, I think it's that we reasonably feel a lot of sympathy for parents who um, are parenting in extremely challenging circumstances who often have their own very serious histories of trauma, including their own childhoods of abuse and neglect. And to be clear, we should absolutely feel sympathy for the parents, but we should not use that sympathy to understate the risk of harm that kids face in those environments. And we also, need to acknowledge the severe vulnerability of children on the basis of age. So about half of children who come into foster care are under the age of five. These are children who cannot feed, clothe, or protect themselves, and they cannot advocate for themselves. And so the, the entire function of the Child Protective Services system is to do that. And we can certainly quibble about the scope of that system, but to um, deny that it's addressing a very serious problem, I don't think is, is accurate. And so to sort of just drive this home, um, so I was a Child Protective Services investigator. Um, and so I just wanna give an example of some of the neglect cases that I investigated. And these are not cherry picked examples of the most extreme cases. In fact, they're cases where no child was removed from the home. So in one example, a neglect referral came in about a child uh, who was 10 years old. And um, the complaint, on its face sounded very frivolous, exactly the sort of cases Amelia was talking about, uh, that the child wasn't being uh, walked to the bus in the morning and wasn't, was missing the bus. So it sounds like nothing, right? So in that particular case, this was a child who had been born with severe uh, fetal alcohol syndrome, syndrome and other developmental disabilities on the basis of the mother's severe and chronic methamphetamine abuse during pregnancy. The mother had also 
engaged in significant physical abuse of the child, um, resulting in permanent scarring, but had managed to retain custody. And so as a result of the child's significant limitations, they were just wandering around, unable to find their way home and unable to find their bus. The school tried repeatedly to interfere um, by contacting the mother, trying to get her to show up um, and walk the child to school. And the mother was not at work. She was not otherwise um, you know, unable to do so. She was just not doing so. Um, and so in that case, right, we have an allegation that seems frivolous, but when you look below the service, the school had a legitimate reason to call, and the mother was seriously endangering her child. Um, and so these sorts of cases are pretty commonplace. Um, another case that I investigated, the complaint was that the children didn't have beds. Um, and I went out to the house, and in fact, they were crated with fencing on top into play pens, so basically in cages. And the parents said, well, they kept trying to escape from their room. And the family preservation program just bought them all new beds, not understanding at all that it was the parental behavior, not the lack of beds, that was contributing to a lack of child safety. And so the basic thesis that I want to say here is poverty is very stressful. It, and money can always enable parents to make better choices and provide better care for their children. But it doesn't force them or require them to do so. And so we need to be very cautious about understanding the capacity of parents to make those choices given resources. Thanks, sir. Lynn? Thank you, Naomi. I loved and enjoyed everything you all said. And I want to put some thought into my experiences working with parents and working with poverty and neglect at the federal level, the most important part that I heard from all three of you and that I have thought of as I've read and studied and talked to individuals is we don't have a good definition of neglect. We don't have a good definition of poverty as compared to neglect. When I heard, um, Sarah, when you said the um, the economic impact alone would not improve the situation for the children in the home based on the situation, whatever, whether it's missing a bus or whether it's a child that has, is FAS. The fact that a caseworker walks in and doesn't know whether this is something economically that could be improved or is it mental health or is it substance abuse, and if it is, then what, is not clear for them in so many states. So I think one of the most critical things we can do, understanding that poverty can be a serious concern that leads into neglect and that can then also be abuse, but we have to be able to get into that home and assess both the parent and the child. It's not just was a child walking to a school bus, but why was the mom not able? What is her history? We can find out what the ACE scores are for the kids but do we look back and say, what were the ACE scores of that parent when they were that age? And if that is a significant issue, then what do we do to protect that child? We have seen kids who have been abused, starting with poverty, moving to abuse, and then being um, seriously, seriously abused to fatality. And so the caseworkers need to be adequately trained to know to look beneath the surface it's not just handing a check. It is the whole picture of the whole family, what is often called two-generation work. The um, community needs to be better trained in looking at poverty and, and neglect. When we look at cases, whether it be a mental health practitioner is visiting a mom, and then the probation officer is visiting the mom, and then the child welfare worker is visiting the mom, and they could all show up in the same day. We never know because we don't talk to each other. Mm -hmm. And then we have a fatality or an egregious harm, and we don't communicate. That has to change because that indicates poverty or neglect or abuse, but the lack of communication sends us kind of over the edge on that one, and we have to improve some of the things in that way. I think it's really critical that we remember that the family has to become part of a community that cares for them. I was a parole officer for many, many years, and as I would go visit my offenders, I had to have at least three to four collateral visits of other people who put their eyes on that person to make sure they were doing okay. 
We don't even require that in child welfare. I can go into the house, scheduled visit, talk to the mom, and walk out and not know from the neighbor or the teacher or anybody else if something has happened. And no one caseworker has that ability to make those decisions all by themselves. So that's something we need to look at while we're looking at definitions of poverty, neglect, and abuse. The communication is really critical. Mental health, and you mentioned that, and substance use. I ran a school around a Head Start to eradicate poverty in my community, and we brought the entire community together. And the Head Start parents opted in. One mom said, I really want to get out of poverty, but the court just ordered that my son go to counseling two times a week, and I have to go once. And it's between 8 and 5, so I have to leave, go pick up my son, take him to counseling, bring him back to school, and go back to work. And my boss just said, you can't work. It, you're gone too much. And the question I had for our mental health world was, why is there nothing after 5? Or why is it limited after 5? And then for this young boy who was in the foster care system, why did he not have that opportunity to do well in school? Where were the tutors? Where were the people that were helping him stay caught up? He was not going to stay caught up. So between the two of them, she wanted to do well by her son, which meant she said, I will stay poor and not work in order to get him to counseling so that I don't have my child removed. I think we have to really analyze all of our systems working together around child protection and child welfare. Child protection can't do this by themselves, and yet it seems like there's a big silo wrapped around them. They don't reach out as much as they could, and other systems don't work with them, and it's under the guise of confidentiality. So I think that is something that really impacts poverty and impacts the confusion around poverty on whether it's economic or whether it's neglect. And so we need to start working and integrating our systems. There is so much money spent in each and every system, and yet they don't work together to raise up a family or to identify if that child should be removed. So that's something I find really critical. One of the other examples that I saw, which leads to this, was a mom who was really struggling financially. Her son had some mental health concerns they would bring everybody, including the court, the mental health center, the paralegals, and they would have one meeting with everybody there, including the school system, to come up with solutions. The, I remember the one situation, the son said, but I'm hearing voices again. So instead of waiting for that six weeks or five weeks to get in to get his meds re readjusted, the court immediately said right then, we'll do this this afternoon. Mental health, can you get them in? Mom, can you get them there? School, will you take them back in if we all do this? And it was done, which all those eyes on that family helped, whether it be neglect or poverty, be less risky. It's nothing, I don't think there's anything we totally do that eliminates risk, which then is the other piece around poverty that I see happening. The fear of litigation, the fear of being sued, has made caseworkers remove children faster because they're being sued now when something doesn't go well. And so they are really quick to remove to prevent that litigation. One really outstanding program that I just saw started in Dallas, Texas. It's called Unite the Church. And we have its pastors training nonprofits going into the inner cities and working with families to talk about what are expectations of parenting, what are not, and then going to court with them when they, the kids are being removed for what is called neglect, but it might actually be a poverty issue. So those kind of things are happening, but we can solve this, and we can strengthen the family, which would then make it more evident on who needs to be removed, and that's not happened yet. Thank you. Um, so I have a bunch of questions for the panelists. I just want to alert everybody at about 2 o'clock, we're going to spend the last 15 minutes or so taking questions from the audience, both in person and uh, online. So if you have questions, uh, please send them in. Um, and if you're in the audience, you should just be thinking about uh, what you want to ask. Um, so I wanted to uh, go back to just to Doug for a minute. Um, you mentioned that um, the, the, there used to be sort of more of a, a hands-on kind of approach to helping families, that, you know, I'm going to take your kids to school. 
Um, you know, most now anti-poverty programs don't look like that. They look like we are going to send you a check, we're going to send you a housing voucher, um, that the ways that we're helping people are, are literally trying to just address their financial situation. Um, do you think that, uh, that this has created um, more of a problem or is it's, it's failed to help solve the problems that we were solving with a more hands-on approach? Oh, wow. Uh, so part of the issue is that same approach got applied to, quote, middle class, highly functioning women whose husbands had left them. Let's just kind of use all the stereotypes. And what they needed was some time to regroup, to retrain, get a job. And in the meantime, they were on welfare. That's how that worked. Um, uh, the more disorganized families did need support. Now, the, the, the connection to what was happening in the 50s and 60s is a little um, inappropriate. I cheated a little because those were largely women from the Great Migration, heavily black, rarely had gone to high school, had been really deprived by Jim Crow in the South. And so the supports they got really did feel like an anti-poverty, anti-racist support. Um, I, as we know from Head Start, Lynn, the mothers now are much more competent than they were when Head Start first started. One of the complications for Head Start. So the answer is a little different. But now to make the point that I think you wanted me to make, which I think is valid, um, which is when we assume all a family needs is money, right? Uh, we foreclose any other kinds of help and support that we can provide. Support, guidance, advice, whatever it is. The tricky part is, as, as I think it was Amelia said, if you have a family that needs advice, there's no one to call except Child Protective Services. Family services have dried up in large parts of the country. Not everywhere, but in large parts of the country. So we ought to be finding some way to help those families within whether it's the TANF system, whether it's some other social services, family services world. But we haven't gotten there. And so the point I feel that we're all sort of in the same place is Child Protective Services being asked to do the thing you think and I think some kind of income maintenance, income support program should do. And just giving people an earned income tax credit isn't going to help them get out of that hole. Um, I wanted to ask you, Amelia, um, you know, Sarah talked a lot about uh, just how much of the problem, statistically speaking, um, involves mental illness or substance abuse. Um, can you talk about, um, you know, your work on the ground, like how much you see that as a problem and, you know, there are different ways. I, I'm, Doug had a, originally another set of slides that maybe he'll, he'll, uh, he'll talk about afterwards. But, um, you know, there are different ways to see kind of poverty here. Poverty may cause both, you know, uh, child welfare problems, may cause abuse and neglect. Um, poverty may also cause unemployment. Um, poverty may cause stress. Um, how do you see kind of the interplay of these things? And, you know, to, just to start with, to what extent do you see the substance abuse and the mental illness on the ground um, as, as problems that are or are not solvable with an anti-poverty solution? Yeah, that's a really great question. I, I'm going to start just a little bit further back because um, kind of my worldview is around childhood trauma. And then we grow up with that trauma and numb it with substance, various substances, or it manifests in symptoms that, that look like mental illness to us. And so, you know, really the consequence of children growing up, not having their needs met, not feeling safe and lovable and like they can trust a protector in their lives manifest in adulthood in a lot of these other ways and then repeat themselves cyclically as they have children. And so, you know, at the core of what we're calling a mental health crisis and at the core of substance use for me is really around the challenge that we're talking about here, which is how do we keep our children safe and connected and nurtured so that they don't have these lifelong 
predictive harms that come from adverse childhood experiences. That's really a root cause solution, and so many of our interventions are symptom reduction. Um, and so, so I'll say that just as a framing my, around my worldview around that and experience. The other thing I'll say is I have been known to say that if we could address the substance use problem in our country, we would solve the child welfare issue. Um, an enormous amount of the families involved in the system are also uh, struggling with substance use as a numbing agent for trauma. And, and so uh, we, we definitely have a, a, a crisis in the availability, accessibility, affordability, and effectiveness, efficacy of our substance use treatment in this country. And so many parents who um, are even seeking help are not able to get it. It's not available in rural communities. The waiting lists are long. They cannot afford it. And so that is a, a really important thing for us to be thinking about and solving as we're addressing what children need as well. Um, Sarah, I was wondering if you, like, when you look at, at the graph that Doug had up, you know, that talked about kind of the, the rise in cases um, over time, I mean, it, it, it coincides, obviously, with a lot of our drug abuse problem in this country, too. I mean, there's, there's different ways, I think, to interpret it. Um, so I guess I want to ask you the same question as Amelia. Like, how do you see um, the kind of causal uh, the, the cause and effect relationships here, poverty and substance abuse and mental illness and, you know, child maltreatment. Where, what does the order look like for you? So I think the best research on this subject suggests that economic support alone would maybe reduce Child Protective Services reports by at most 10%. So that remaining 90% um, suggests that maybe there's other stuff, right? other things that are needed. And I think, yeah, certainly a big part of that is substance use. Um, and the reality is, you know, we wanna talk about prevention and wouldn't it be great if we could present, prevent maltreatment before it starts? But in a lot of cases, the biggest proportion of kids reported to CPS are in their first few years of life. They were born into an environment when they were already at extreme risk due to things like substance use. And so the time for prevention um, at the moment of birth has, in some cases, already passed. And so, uh, to Amelia's point, when we're talking about adults who are significantly traumatized themselves, the best time to prevent child maltreatment is before they start a family. Lynn, I was, I was actually, you know, I was gonna ask you about how you see, um, I mean, you know, we have, there are different risks for different age groups here. I think as Sarah was saying, you know, how should we be looking at kids in the system, um, you know, where they're, they're under the age of, of five or under the age of three versus older, and, and what possibilities kind of uh, providing for their material needs offer us for older kids versus versus younger kids. Can you, can you think about kind of trying to sort out these kids into different groups and understanding, help us understand kind of what the, what the possibilities are, do you think, for those different groups of kids? I do think that the zero to five group is most at risk. And as we look at the, especially the zero to three, they don't have a voice, they can't protect themselves, and we really don't know what's happening in all of those situations. Economically, I am not convinced that economically a check makes a difference in these families. Um, but what I have seen when you talk about the older kids versus the younger kids, often it's a sibling group. And the younger kids can get parental termination, their rights terminated faster, and then go to adoption while the siblings still sit. And so economically for the older kids, we're talking about normalizing their experience in child welfare more so than protection because they are going to schools, they want to play sports, they should be able to learn to drive, they should be able to go into higher ed. The little ones, it is getting them to be able to do those things as they're older. So the extra funding, not necessarily going to a family, but going into supports and protections in that family first before they're removed, and then around that child, mm -hmm. reunification for some of these families is not an option but we wait an awful long time, which then causes the additional trauma for the kids as they get older. 
Um, I just I want to ask sort of a question for for all of you, and then you should feel free to kind of respond to each other. You're all very timid on this panel, so I'm, I'm going to ask you to start responding to each other too. Otherwise, I'll just sit here <laughs> asking questions all day. Um, so the the new um, AFCARS report just came out. It showed a very significant decrease uh, in the number of kids in care uh, who are in in foster care last year. And and Lynn, I guess this makes me ask me ask you a little bit about your your point earlier that you think that. Some workers are being too quick to remove kids. This suggests that we've really seen a dramatic drop in kids going into foster care. Um, you know, how how should we evaluate that number? Um, and you know, what what should we think about that number in terms of the economic situation of American families? Uh, is that is that number good news? Does that suggest that some kids are 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 you know not going into foster care who shouldn't have been? Um, should we worry about some of the kids who maybe should have been going into foster care? Um, and and how do we how should we think about that? I guess in terms of the economics of these families too. I would start with just the piece. Sorry, sir. Um, just that one piece of we we don't know based on COVID and the pandemic the, that time period whether the reason they're not coming in is because of that or whether there was a reduction in abuse and neglect, or whether there was a reduction in the number of calls to a hotline. We know there were, was a reduction of calls to a hotline. But if, as far as it, while the kids are living at home with their mom and dad and everyone is there, was it abusive or was it better? I don't think we really have that answer yet. So if we were to get two years of AFCAR's data and it says the same thing, then we really need to dig into that to make sure that some, what is it that's working? or are, do we have more egregious harm? Do we have more fatalities? What other numbers can we look at to make sure children are safe? Mm -hmm. so, oh, Sarah, I think it's almost entirely diagnostic shift, by which I mean that given the same level of risk, caseworkers are making different decisions about whether to remove. And you can see that as a good or bad thing. Uh, I tend to think of it as, um, in the same way I think about something like chemotherapy, if those numbers go up or down, you really just want to know, do more or less people have cancer? Um, not thinking about the intervention in that as being inherently good or bad. Um, so I, I think uh, until we have really high confidence in the quality of investigations that are conducted by Child Protective Services, and I do not think based on the sort of audits that have been done of, um, of investigations that we should have that level of confidence, uh, we just can't know. I think that's a, I mean, a good point to start with is we're just still making sense of this data and nobody really knows. And so we're, we're providing some conjectures, conjecture on that. Um, I, might, I might offer some things I'm hearing from the field as alternative explanations. Uh, one is we lost a lot of women from the workforce. Um, well over a million women stopped working and their women at home is associated with a decrease in maltreatment when there are um, absent fathers or they're not present. So women are a protective factor for kids. And so that could be one of the reasons driving it. Um, another is that there is just frankly less surveillance on families. We were all home behind closed doors and separate from one another. So there was less uh, surveillance to, to families for what might be reported in. And so you might, you might imagine that there's just less report, less um, intervening because less, less children are in the public eye. Um, law enforcement and education are in many, most jurisdictions, typically the highest reporters of child abuse and neglect and are notoriously bad reporters meaning that they have the least amount of substantiations. They just kind of report everything and let the hotline decide. So in those cases, not being in school and, and not being exposed um, and not being on the bus or in the community or at after school things, there was just less opportunity to report things that folks might be worried about, or even in the case that I talked about, you know, wanting to report for help, not necessarily um, abuse and neglect, less of that opportunity given COVID. And so I, I'm not sure that we, we know yet. I think we all, um, we people who care about kids, many people worried about COVID, about not having eyes on kids, right? And that if they weren't in school and they weren't in front of people, where are we going to come back to school 
and then find that so many of these kids had been living in dangerous or worrisome conditions. And frankly, that just didn't happen, right? We didn't see kids coming back and reports shoot up about um, you know, substantiated abuse and neglect. So the kind of worst fears did not materialize post-COVID. So then you have to start thinking about um, if, if we don't see an increase in substantiated abuse and neglect, were they really okay without us? <laughs> and, and is there something in the system where we're over intervening or over surveilling that is leading and driving those? Yeah, I mean, there, I guess there, there were some studies that suggested there were a big increase in um, severe abuse cases that showed up in emergency rooms, which suggested that we weren't seeing things earlier on in the process. So, I, I mean, I think just like COVID policies varied significantly from locale to locale, I think the effects of those policies varied too. Um, but, but I wonder, um, I don't know, Doug, whether you have, sorry, you're... Go ahead, yeah. No, um, whether whether you have uh, some thoughts about, do you think these these numbers are going down because we're offering more material supports for families, or because we're sort of doing anything to uh, to pick away at, at at the at least let's say ten percent that Sarah's talking about, um, you know who who, co who could be sort of you know funneled out of the child welfare system if we offered them more material supports. Well, I'll start talking, but if I could use this as, as I go, I'll oh, get there. Oh, absolutely. Um, I think I can find it quickly. Oh, good. Uh, here's an interesting uh, whoops, slide. Uh, this is the decline in child poverty over, I think, 25 years or 30 years. I can't see the bottom. And you can see that poverty went down from about 30% of all children to around 11% uh, recently. And that's all because of, almost all because of federal assistance. Uh, there's more labor force participation, but in any event, less poverty. Um, the striking thing is the child neglect numbers went down a little bit, not that much. The abuse numbers went down substantially, um, and the sexual abuse numbers went down substantially. That's the comparison. So if you were trying to make an argument that giving people money reduced child maltreatment, it wouldn't make, you would, couldn't make the case with the neglect line. You might be able to make the case with the abuse line, but it's probably much more complicated. It's all the things I think that Amelia said. Uh, now to directly answer your question, I think in almost every community, what is a report, what is a, di what is a substantiated or founded report is largely an administrative decision and a political decision. I believe it's the case, and everybody here can correct me, we have the highest levels of um, school absenteeism now than we've had for decades. And I believe that is not a child protective concern yet, which is to say 10, 20, 30% of inner city children who are not going to school are not being reported to child protective services. And that's a, that's a substantive decision that I don't think anyone took a vote about. You and mean I, as during COVID, or you? you just no, mean now today. Today, right? But you, do you mean since COVID? When? When? Yeah. The, so the okay. absentee rate has never recovered from COVID. Okay, that's what I. I just I'm wanted, sorry. Yeah. So we're we're isolating just the last three years. And we're so. not seeing those cases in the child protective caseload. Mm -hmm. I, I, yeah. I think that's right. Right. We not Relatively few states um, have those cases handled by child welfare, um, and juvenile justice doesn't want those cases, and so they just kind of say, maybe it's yours, maybe it's yours, and no one, no one wants to deal with it. And therefore, these numbers are all suspect, <laughs> uh, uh, and we can make up any conclusion we want. No, but seriously, what that means is if we see a decline in children being placed in foster care, that can be COVID, that can be fear, about anti-racist reactions because so many of these children are people of color, children of color. Um, and so that all is a, you know, another level of concern for the health and welfare of the children. Um, I just have one last question then I'm gonna open it up to the audience. Um, let's say we do some of the things that Lynn and Amelia were talking about and we sort of offer some of these material supports in different ways. Um, to families who have been reported for neglect. Um, how, I guess, sometimes the child welfare system always has this uncomfortable question of, 
how many chances do parents get? It's a very, it's a hard question. It's not, um, there's, there's not always a definitive answer. But, you know, let's say you find that, you know, that this family really does need a bed or coats or more food or a better housing situation, and you provide those, and the family is re-reported. How are we kind of keeping track of, or are we keeping track of kind of what, what is being offered to that family and whether kind of chipping away at the poverty aspect of what's ailing them um, is contributing to more successful outcomes for that family and families like it? So it would be an unequivocal disaster to systematically tie economic assistance to Child Protective Services involvement. We already have cases where well-intentioned people are reporting families for poverty because they think CPS has resources the family can't access elsewhere. So if we want those families not to come into CPS, we absolutely should not tie any economic support to CPS contact. Um, it's a terrible incentive structure. Um, so, but unfortunately that already happens, right? Um, CPS will pay families first month's rent or other things um, that they can't access through any other system. Um, and it's created then this um, self-fulfilling prophecy that families are getting involved with CPS due to poverty. I think, I think just to say there is a strong movement in the field to de-link those two. And, and I hear your, your reasoning, Sarah, and the other reason is because if families come in contact with Child Protective Services to get resources they need, they then open themselves and their door and their family to the potential of having their children removed to family separation. So they don't want to either, right? Like, hello, could I get some help? I'm drinking too much. We'll be right over, you know, or whatever it is. Well, if you call for help and you risk losing what is most precious to you, you don't make that call and therefore things get out of hand and you don't go early. So there is a movement really in child welfare and systems <laughs> that are working in transformation who are concerned about early intervention and prevention and I totally agree with you, back as far as you can get is, you know, before children are even conceived is the place to do trauma work. And when you can't do that, then it's right where you are. That's, it. That's the place to be. Um, however, you know, really thinking about how do we create community-based systems? How do we create networks of natural supports and peer supports? How do we get communities to be, um, you know, resourced in ways to help neighbors and communities so that it's de-linked from child protection. That is a movement that is happening in many jurisdictions and it's frankly kind of going back to what people will recall like, oh, when we were, you know, went through a bad time, Mrs. Johnson left groceries on our, our, our doorstep and we're, we're really far away from that and have really become um, system involved and reliant in ways where uh, natural supports and communities have been degraded. And so rebuilding those community supports, thinking about peer supports, people have been there. Systems are hiring parents who have successfully come out the other side of the child protection system as peer mentors, peer supports, community-based organizations providing those services. So, so there, that is happening. I'd I do, like to add, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. I want, I'm moving on, so if you want to say something about that, feel free. Well, I think it's related to that. Okay. Um, here we are at AEI. Uh, I think a big culprit is federal interference with these programs, with all due respect, Lynn. I'm 100% with you. So before the feds were involved, some communities did what Amelia said, other communities didn't. But they didn't, the director of social services didn't get up in the morning and say, have I met my federal guidelines today? The director would wake up and say, am I doing the best for my clients, if, if he or she was a good director? Uh, we have made a, we have tried to make a national system that's supposed to fit in San Francisco, in New York, in Colorado, Mississippi, and the variations are very large. Some communities have a vibrant, non-governmental, a voluntary sector. Others don't. Some might develop them. Some have. Um, philanthropists who might help, and churches and so forth. But the system dictated by federal legislation is, here's a list of things that have to be reported. If the states don't have a law that requires that, they don't get their assistance. Here's the process required by the federal law about how you investigate these cases. Here's the, here are the rules about foster care placements. 
here are the rules about kinship placements. And back when I was in a state, we had loads more flexibility than we have now. Mm -hmm. And so, when, yeah. so I'll, 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 I'll stop. I just want to add on to that very quickly. What I took um, when I had the opportunity to sit at the federal level, which wasn't very long, I, I took all of the federal rules and regulations and aligned them with several different states. What happens is we have that basis from the feds, and then you had 10 times, if not more, rules and regulations that come on board. Every time there is an egregious harm or something that hits the paper in a state, that legislature will pass 10 laws or different rules. So I found, contrary to that, that the feds are pretty limited in what they require, and the states add on quite more until you start doing state plans and then that person who reviews the state plans decides, I think you need to add another 100 things. So we have a problem with that because the states with the Child Welfare Block Grant, we shouldn't be dicti dictating as much from the federal level and we really should not be doing this by the hundreds of new legislation legislators that want to address one fatality. We legislate to the extreme in these cases and we forget to really support what would work. Amelia, we, we yeah, I want to go back to track. I could spend so much time on what we just did, but I'm going to go back to what <laughs> you said, um, Naomi, around um, this idea of how many chances do we give family, right? And I, I think it's um, a question that cannot be asked without asking the other on balance. So say you decide, whatever you decide, we decide three chances, four chances, two years, one year, whatever you decide, right, in that way. The question is, and then what? And then what? And, and if you don't hold those two questions in balance, then it doesn't make sense to just be addressing how many chances. Because if what it means is, and then what? And then you remove their children, redistribute them to unrelated persons, we do not have enough people in this country to care for all the kids we are removing. They are true. right now, they are right now living and sleeping in offices, in hotels, all over this country. And so we have a crisis in placements in, in, uh, in the country. So what happens? And what about the lifelong predictive harm of family separation? What do we know about the outcomes for kids who spend time in care? about the implications for attachment and lifelong thriving for kids who get moved from place to place to place as they exhibit their, their pain-based behaviors. So we have to, you have to look on balance, right? It's not just we should stop giving you chances and then, you know, is, is what happens to the children then worse than giving another chance here? And I think that discussion has to happen together because we make these artificial and false choices as though removing the children give them a better life when when we know from the research that that is just not accurate and so and experience and the outcome study so wow. i think as it's important that research, so, did, yeah so i'm gonna let sarah respond and then lynn because um, sarah's done some of that research yeah okay so one children are sleeping in offices largely because one we've shut down all the congregate care facilities we've made those True. very hard to access and children need congregate care because in many cases, we waited so long to remove that their behavior, their trauma reactions are so extreme that they cannot be safely in a family home. That is why kids are sleeping in offices. There are not infants and toddlers sleeping in offices. Though There are a million families who would be happy to take in those kids. There are also a lot of families willing to take in older kids, um, older kids with behavioral challenges. But the system makes it extremely challenging to do so. The outcomes of foster care are complicated because foster care looks really, really different state to state. You look at a state like Illinois, where once you come into care, you never leave. You have basically a zero chance of getting adopted. Your outcomes are pretty bad, and the research backs that up. If you look at other states where they, um, they work with families and get kids reunified or they get kids adopted, those outcomes are generally better than if they had remained in the home. When we use research on kids who age out of care um, to say something about the foster care system as a whole, we're being very distorted because only about 9% of kids who are in foster care ever age out of care. And the ones who age out of care are the ones who are removed as teenagers, which is often far, far too late to expect that we can meaningfully improve their outcomes. 
Um, we should still try and give them every resource we have available to us, but to say that um, it's the fault of the foster care system when a child has been abused for 15 years and the foster care system can't turn things around in three is totally ridiculous. I'm going to give Lynn a chance to respond, and then we're going to have to open it up for questions. I'll go Absolutely. ahead, Lynn. I think that it is really critical that when we look at kids and their parents and the length of time, I work with the young people that age out of foster care, and they will say, you know, 18 years, 62 moves, those things were not good for me. But if they would have let my parents stay more involved or have um, permanency with their friends from school or a teacher, when, because each time they move to a different school, we are separating and breaking off an attachment. So we can't measure whether it's to the parents or whether it was to their best friends from this school and then the next school or from that foster home. So as we look at, I think the stability and the, the number of moves is critical. But what I'm seeing is a new movement throughout the country where we're keeping parents involved even though um, the rights have been terminated. That they are like aunt or uncle or grandparents, but while they've been adopted, they still have this ongoing relationship. That relational permanency matters, and we're seeing significant impact on the reduction of the trauma impacts. Almost every young person that I've worked with that has aged out does this travel throughout the country to go back to that beautiful thing of mom and dad who had to have gotten their lives together since they were placed in foster care. And they find out it's not always that good. But that we also forget that who was harmful to a three-year-old may absolutely be OK for a 16-year-old with support. Right. And so we could do more reunifications if needed if that child's not adopted. It's that case that just flounders in the system that where the parents could become that additional support. So I think you're totally right, but I just want to say it is extraordinarily, extraordinarily rare to come into foster care as a young child and age out. The vast majority of kids who age out of foster care came into care in early or late adolescence, not in early childhood. Um, and there's no excuse for a system to remove a child as an infant or toddler and let them stay in care for 18 years. I agree. And the, the sort of systematic retreat from adoption as an appropriate alternative is the reason those cases happen. And I also I agree on the, um, sorry, <laughs> one, piece, you off. One, one more piece. The, um, the kids that are aging out have had one, two, three, four, five failed adoptions, and we have got to handle that too. All right, mm -hmm. questions. Uh, there's a microphone, so if you just wait for it and then ask your question. Go ahead. Hi, uh, I'm Sam Owens. I'm an RA here in Poverty Studies. I was wondering about um, sort of about expectations of parenting. Um, <clears throat> one thing that we often worry about, uh, you know, when we're talking about welfare, that kind of thing, is paternalism. You know, are we uh, trying to force like a set of values onto people? So I was, I, I think the best way to phrase the question is, you, when we have these cases of neglect, um, you know, one thing you could imagine is happening is the parents understand, you know, oh, I should have beds for my kids. They understand they're, they're uh, providing like sub, a substandard like state of living for their kids and they would like to do better. And then on the other hand, you might imagine they just, for lots of different reasons, they might just not think this is a problem or they might have, you know, yeah, their standard of how to raise a kid is just different than like mm -hmm. what the standard for neglect is. Um, so I'm kind of wondering about how, how often you see that it, which of those uh, fits the more of the cases of neglect. And then I'm also wondering about how effective is it to, you know, sort of have the, like, social worker tells you that you need to get your kid to school on time. Like, how often does that actually translate to the parents' understanding and agreeing to that? You want to take that? And it's an interesting question, sort of, like, how conscious are parents of what the problems are that are going on? My experience is that um, parents don't come to the attention of the child welfare system because they don't love their kids and they don't come to the attention of the child welfare system because they need parenting classes. Um, it really is a variety of other factors at play. When parenting comes at play, it's often a cultural issue that in my culture we use corporal punishment that's not acceptable here or, or that they get reported for those reasons. But it, it typically is not because they don't know how to parent. 
it's usually other drivers. And we've talked a lot about them here. Mental health, trauma, substance use, poverty. There are a lot of other drivers that are interfering with their capacity and ability to provide the protection necessary. A, a friendly amendment? Yes, please. But, but, but really friendly, because I think that's right. There were other cases. I, I, I remember visiting a, a, a program for pregnant substance abusing parents. Yeah. And however they were raised as kids or not, they didn't know to smile at their children when they were changing their diapers. This is a sort of a ridiculous point, unless you've ever changed a diaper. And you realize that if you smile, it makes the process a lot more pleasant because more often than not, the child will smile back at you. And I watched this was part of their curriculum for the parents. And they developed for the parents, these sort of newborns, newborns, this feedback, emotional feedback loop with the children. Uh, so yes, on everything except, I think there are times when parenting information is useful. Yeah, I'll, I mean, I'll accept the amendment and I'll build on the amendment. Good. Um, is when we're talking about abuse and neglect, it's usually for these other drivers. So the first part of the sentence is a, a parent using substances. Like that's an indicator that something else went really wrong before. Um, and so are there, are there ways once you get the trauma, the mental health, the substance use, that parenting can be enhanced? For every one of us. I needed it myself, right? And so I think, yes, there are, there are ways that we can add that in. But it's usually not people coming to the attention of child welfare because they didn't know to smile while diaper changing, right? It's not, those aren't the things that are bringing them forward. It can make them better parents. Um, and all of us better parents, but it, that, it, that isn't usually the driver of the abuse and neglect. Well, there's a higher level of parenting skills that are needed, right? Once you're engaged in abuse and neglect, your child is going to behave and function differently, and you have to parent differently in order for them to rebound. And so, um, right, we train foster parents um, on specifically how to deal with children who have been traumatized, how to manage trauma-related behaviors. Um, Biological parents who come to the attention of CPS likely need a lot of those same skills, but they're not offered in the same way. More questions? Okay, I'm going to ask one last question in my, uh, as my, my role as moderator. Um, I wanted to, to ask about, um, we, we were talking a minute ago about kind of the role of the federal versus the state governments here. Um, and I wanted to ask a little bit, because um, now Lynn and Amelia, you, you have experience kind of working in the sort of nonprofit sector too. Um, I, I was recently talking to someone about a program called Safe Families, which I'm sure a lot of you are aware of. It's all over the country. Um, and with the exception of actually, I think, two states, New York and Colorado, um, Safe Families can get referrals from child welfare. Um, so Safe Families is a program where these, these are typically people who are, who are not involved in the child welfare system yet, or that was how the program was designed. Um, and parents can call Safe Families and ask for someone to care for their child um, in a crisis situation. Maybe they have surgery, maybe they need to go into drug rehab or something like that. And the idea is that Safe Families has a lot of trained background check volunteers who can take your child for you know, up, up to six months, I think, even. Um, and, and you can get your child back whenever you want. So parents you know, have a, a, a kind of um, ability to do this without sort of getting caught up in the system. But uh, what's happened to Safe Families in the last couple of years is that uh, they've now started receiving referrals from child welfare. And there are some people who are concerned that Safe Families is now sort of becoming an alternative form of foster care. Um, and I tell this story, you know, I think it's, it's kind of interesting the way it's turned out, but it also seems to be a situation in which state governments have kind of co-opted or really gotten involved in the way a private nonprofit is supposed to run to be helping these families. And so, well, I think, you know, the question of like where the federal government ends and where the state government begins is one issue. I was wondering if you could kind of talk about how we sort of maintain these um, kind of private efforts that you're working on, Lynn, or that you're working with, Amelia, um, so that they don't become kind of another door through which people then get involved in the child welfare system. I think it's one thing with, say, families or kin and grandparents 
it, it um, skews the numbers because they don't go into being, oh, this child's been removed, they've gone into foster care, now they're, they stay in foster care this long. When they're in these private systems where a parent just works with them, it, look, it may look like a state's doing extremely well, when in reality, now the private entity has taken that piece over. And that could be good or bad, but it tells us that we don't really know the real numbers, especially around kin and grandparents. Camille? To that point, Lynn, which I uh, agree with, it also, um, because we link resources to involvement in the system, where in many states, kinship providers have to be licensed to meet the same license criteria as an unrelated person, um, it also means that if you come in through a side door, you might not have access to the same resources. That's another challenge. But I think your, your question, too, was about how do we maintain the separateness of these efforts and, and ensure that, that the private or nonprofit sector is able to supplement rather than become an arm of? And, um, you know, to be honest, a, a good deal of our efforts are philanthropically funded to build a proof of concept and data around acting in, in alternative ways might we be able to provide better outcomes so we do it that way um, I do I do think that you know our our funding model in child welfare I don't know if anybody here would disagree is is a bit uh, in need of reform and that's a, a Minnesota understatement so um, we we really have a complex and inadequate funding system and to meet the current needs and to meet the needs we're asking the system to do. I mean, it's really based on funding being accessible once family and children are separated and, and under actually your administration, Lynn, there was advancements in Family First um, to make more that, that funding accessible. But nonprofits who work in the space of child welfare really have to be engaged with the system to secure funding in a lot of ways. And so, um, unless the funding model is done differently where, and some systems are thinking about this, how do we divest the, the public resources, people, funding, and others into community-based organizations that are separate to, again, kind of delink the child welfare involvement with the support, so the helpline versus the hotline. Um, you know, I think there are experiments and, and beginnings of that, and, and Family First Services Prevention Act gave us some flexibility uh, around that a little bit, but we still have a long way to go to, to de-link de and separate those to be able to provide services in different ways. So I actually totally agree. I actually have in my notes, there should never be any service short of foster care that requires CPS involvement to access. I, that, there, it makes no sense. Um, there are a lot of families who voluntarily will not take up services and there might need to be oversight or court ordered services, but the service itself should never require CPS involvement. All right, great. Well, that's our panel for today. Please join me in thanking everyone. Thank you all. And please come back December 12th for substance abuse and child maltreatment. Thank you.